to access these in the other room. <laughs> Some reason my new glasses want to keep catching masks. I don't know what it is. Well, anyway, good morning, one and all. Good morning. And it is good to see everybody today, and we're gathered here. And uh, a few announcements to make today. We're starting to do like a church again here. We got announcements. First of all, we're collecting change for is the change going to the food bank. Yes, and uh, another thing I forgot. Food bank and another thing, which Heifer, I'm sure you'll be happy to support. Anyway, Heifer project. Heifer project. Heifer project. So anyway, we brought in the change. We have what we call the permanent clothing vacation fund, which is a change jar we throw <laughs> stuff in. But there ain't gonna be no vacation this year, so it's going to these good causes. Um, so remember that. And I think a lot of you have been out to see the design by mine out there, but if you haven't, go out and see what they've done out there. There's some really remarkable stuff out there. It looks great, and we're happy for that. <laughs> Remind everybody today, we will be having communion. It's going to be a little different, because I think we all got our little Florida communion kits. And because of the interesting experience of getting those open, we're not going to try to partake of the elements in unison. We just have everybody take it at We'll have a quiet time and everybody take at their own pace and their own ability to get the thing open and without you know, undue disaster. Reminder, next week before church, and I'm sorry to say it'll have to be private because of the nature of the times in which we live in, there will be a baptism. Young Henry, what's the last name, Clinch? Yes. Young Henry Clinch is going to get baptized by social distancing. I think it's going to be addicted. A lot of it's going to be on Zoom and everything else. So I think it's going to be interesting. And oh, folks at home who watch this on video might want to put a pause at some point to get if whatever crackers or juice they have for their communion time at that point, too. Um, any other announcements or anything we need to share? Well, once again, it is good to see everyone and good to be gathered together, whether it's the, the groups sitting here or whether it's all of you folks at home. We are glad to be together and be one body of Christ gathered together. Let's be now in a spirit of worship. Come apart from the chaos a while and dwell in the presence of God, who is the source of our being. God calls us to renew ourselves and our life's purpose as we gather with those who are searching. Let us be in prayer together and let us pray. Come to our aid, compassionate one. We have need of your mercy. Listen to us now as we pray and teach us your words of life. In our opening hymn, which we'll hear is There is a Ball in Gilead.
The scripture reading for today is from Exodus chapter 14, verses 19 through 31. The angel of God, who was going before the Israelite army, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night, and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall from them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that he turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, Let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea so the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and chariot drivers. The entire army of Pharaoh that had fallen into the sea, no one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the water forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. This is the scripture reading for today. May we hear the word of God for us. I was listening to the hymn, There is Balm in Gilead, and it occurred to me that when Jeremiah, that's based on a verse from Jeremiah where he asked, is there no balm in Gilead? And he asked that during a time of national crisis, national division, when people really did not know what was gonna happen and uh, it just felt like all of God's promises had failed. And it occurred to me, I didn't even think of this when I picked it, but while I was sitting and listening, it occurred to me it just feels very topical right now, doesn't it, with all that's going on in the world. Among our prayer concerns today, thinking of our family, of uh, Inspector Herrera and of the police department that is going through such a hard time in our community. Um, the fires on the West Coast are just horrible. Just absolutely horrible. They're like Oregon alone is looking at a half a million people possibly having to evacuate. Of course, the ongoing COVID crisis and all the rest, and uh, our political life. I don't care what your political stance is right now, whether you're far right, far left, or dancing around the middle like me. It doesn't feel right. It just feels very very disturbing right now. I mean, people are fighting in the streets. That's not America. I'm sorry, that's not who we are. Anyway, let's be some time now of silent prayers for these concerns, for friends, for community, for the church, and any other silent concerns you bring today before we have our morning prayers. Let us be now in the spirit of prayer. <laughs> O oh God, source of love and compassion for all the sufferings of your children, 
We offer our compassion for the hungry and the sick in body, mind, or heart, the depressed and lonely, all living in fear and under stress of different kinds, all who are stricken with grief, the unemployed and the rejected, those caught up in resentment and hatred and division. Strengthen us, your church, to work for their healing and inspire us to work with you to build the commonwealth of love where none shall cause suffering to others and all are caring, loving children of yours. Compassionate, all-embracing God, ever-present, ever-loving, and never-failing, we ask all these prayers in our unspoken prayers in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. like to dedicate this song to my older brother he passed away about five years ago he was a singer in the family but we are always close and the title of this is peace in the valley No more sorrow or sound. 
Thank you so very much. That was excellent. Our New Testament lesson is from the Gospel of Matthew, from the 18th chapter. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often, how often should I forgive? As many times as seven? And Jesus said, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, equivalent to billions of dollars to him. And he, and as he could not pay, the Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions until payment be made. So the sweet slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave his debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. And when his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused, and he went and threw him in prison until he could pay the debt. And when his fellow slaves saw what would happen, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. That his Lord summoned them and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, the Lord handed him over to be tortured until he should pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother and your sister from your heart. This is God's word, and we can trust it. We can trust it, but it bothers me. This is a very well-known parable, of course, and it's often used, but it bothers me. What bothers me is the ending. My problem isn't that the unforgiving slave was punished, but the way he was punished. He is sent off to be tortured until he can pay the whole debt. And that debt is 10,000 talents of gold, which is basically an, a sum that cannot possibly be repaid. If you translate it into the modern money, it would be an insane amount of money. So basically, this is being equivalent to being tortured to death long and slow. Bothers me. And then there's Jesus' point. My heavenly Father will do the same to you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Lord, are there any exceptions? The point seems to be eternal torment if we can't forgive from the heart. Because I still have unresolved grudges. I'm still mad at people from eighth grade. So I don't like the sounds of, uh, they have it coming too. They richly deserve it. And I don't like the, I came across one on Facebook and it was all I could do not to let them have it. I don't like this. It bothers me. Guess what? Come right on in. But guess what? It's supposed to to bother you. It's supposed to bother us. Years ago, I read a commentary on this on a lesson from Fred Craddock, a great disciples preacher and a teacher of preaching, who addressed the question of this very disturbing ending. And he wrote that there are times when things in church get to a place where the preacher just has to speak loudly because people need to hear what they're saying. He went on to suggest that maybe this was such a time in Matthew's church 
Because in writing this gospel, we always need to remember, Matthew wrote this gospel not mainly to write a biography of Jesus. He wrote it to preach to his church. And this very hard saying was Matthew's way of making the congregation aware of how serious the situation was. So that got me to wondering if we might try today to read between the lines of Matthew's sermon a little bit in order to get an inkling of what might have been going on in that church. That's one thing that biblical scholarship does. It tries to determine what was going on in the community that produced a particular book or writing in order to understand what the writing writer was saying to them. Because knowing what the writer was saying to them can help us to understand what that same writer might have to say to us today. So our mission today is to listen to a circle. Well, that's what you came for, so it's good. Now, judging by what we've read in the last couple of weeks, Matthew's church sounds to me like it was having a problem with forgiveness. In last week's lesson, we read Jesus' teaching on how to handle conflicts between church members, and there was a strong emphasis on reconciliation. And today, Jesus is prompted by Peter's question about how many times to forgive. And as and he says seven times, and Jesus says no, seventy-seven times. Almost as impossible a number as the amount the slave owed. So what's the unforgiving slave's problem? He owed his Lord, his, his owner, basically, an unforgiving imaginable sum of money and he came expecting judgment and he got it it was ordered that he and his family and all they had be sold toward paying off the debt though it wouldn't be a drop in a bucket and he came expecting justice and he was prepared to try to make a deal with justice let me go be patient I'll pay you back I'll find a way even though they both knew that this was impossible Instead, his Lord had compassion on him. Just like that, I forgive the whole debt. And you know what? He had no idea how to handle that kind of forgiveness. He was a little bit like a criminal who gets off light and instead of saying, I've got another chance and I need to do something with it, instead said, well, I got away with it, so I'm gonna go do it again. He just thought he'd been left off the hook, and it changed nothing about it. He did not understand what the ruler had done for him and for his family. He had no idea what it meant to be forgiven and the bad things that followed from that. <laughs> so what I'm thinking, Matthew, pardon me, must have had a church that didn't understand what it meant to be forgiven. So forgiveness, that forgiveness wasn't making a difference in their life together. They were trying to be a community without it. And it wasn't working. Because without forgiveness in the long run, there cannot be community. So Matthew, at the end of this, is raising his voice at the end of this sermon a little bit because everything depended on them learning and knowing from the heart what it meant to be forgiven so that they could know what it meant to forgive. Awful lot of us are in that same proverbial boat as Matthew's church, if we're hearing this sermon right, because most people, I would say, really don't understand what being forgiven means. Oh, but I, I struggle with it. We know the word, we think it's good, but we don't really get what being forgiven actually involves. So we keep living like it hasn't actually happened. That was the slave's problem. So he went on like nothing had changed, and as a result, nothing did. And until we live like forgiveness makes a difference, it doesn't. Now what if that servant, that slave, after being forgiven, 
had gone out and forgiven the people who owed him money. Doesn't just give them a break to pay on the installment plan or something, but said the debt's forgiven. We'd be hearing a different sermon, that's what. Because Matthew would be addressing a very different situation in his church. The sermon we do hear is about a congregation struggling to learn to live as forgiven people in a, ch in a church. People just like us, in other words. Just like every church. I've never been a part of a church in every way that didn't have struggles with this. Matthew is preaching about our story and the stories of every church that has ever grappled with forgiveness, which means basically every church. And I think it's important to remember that this is written to a church, to a community, and not to individuals. It's important because we learn the meaning of forgiveness in communities, like families and church, and that's where we learn the meaning of forgiving and being forgiven. We learn it there because that's where we need it. I don't know if hermits need to learn how to forgive, but we live in communities, families, churches, other things. We need to learn to forgive just to continue to be a community. We can't be church. We can't be anything really without forgiveness. So we need to learn it here in the midst of people that we sometimes need to forgive and who sometimes need to forgive us. And we learn it by doing where it's required, even if it means forgiving somebody over and over for the same failings, 70 times seven or more. Jesus said, and that's how it becomes a habit of the heart. We keep trying doing it until we get it right. And as a writer named Tamara Fife said, it's a habit that brings freedoms to our hearts and to our relationships. They bother me. Those hard, hard words about what happens if we don't forgive one another from the heart. In other words, in a way that makes a difference and changes us. Good news in this. Jesus does not set a time limit. I don't have to forgive everybody by Friday. Thank goodness. But we do have to forgive. And we do have to be learning what it is because we can't be church without it. And as John A. Nelson wrote, we will always be faced with the mess of offenses against us and those dear to us. And a wise teacher said, forgiveness means giving up hope, the hope of a better past. The hope of a better past hope that somehow it'll be different. Because I think sometimes that's why we hold on to resentment. The idea that something's going to happen to change what's happened. It's not going to happen. But something can happen to change how we look at it. And that something is forgiveness. And sometimes that means letting go of what we are richly entitled to. Forgiveness means letting go of our expectation of justice. Of, of getting and that's a hard thing to do, but it's the only hope we have, I think. Forgiveness isn't learned by thinking about it. God knows I've tried. It's learned by trying to live it where it's needed most. And where's that? Whether you're in the sanctuary or sitting at home, we're all sitting there. Let's pray. Oh God, it is so very hard to forgive and so very important that we learn to do so. Help us to let go of the hope that the past can be changed. Even when we're richly entitled to justice for a wrong somebody has done us, help us to be willing to let go of that for the sake of our freedom and peace and for our communities to grow together. All this we ask in the name who embodied forgiveness. Christ our Savior. Amen. Let us break bread together.
been a long time since I stood behind one of these. This is the Lord's table. And Christ invites each one of us to share in his meal. Christ recognizes you as you are and looks on you with favor. Christ befriends you. Christ wants you to be part of his circle. So count yourself among Christ's disciples because Jesus says that we are by partaking in this feast of fellowship. Let us pray. Christ Jesus, our living bread, we praise your mercy in the memorial of your love. As we keep in mind your life, death, and resurrection, let our feast of thanksgiving enable us to share with one another the goodness and love you have showered upon us. Amen. For I deliver to you what the Lord Jesus also delivered unto the church, that on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, given for you. And in the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The table is set. These are the gifts of God for the people of God, and all Christians are invited to participate. We ask it now that it's not our common practice, but we take a quiet moment to reflect and partake of the Lord's Supper at our own pace. We'll take a few seconds to do it. Let us pray once again. We have received from your hand, God, bread from the earth to strengthen us, and the fruits of the vine to gladden our spirits. May these signs of Christ's presence fill our lives with such gratitude that we are led to share the joy wherever we go. Now our closing hymn, Go My Children with My Blessing. God's good words. Here we have been fed at God's table and strengthened by the fellowship of the body of Christ gathered here and at home. And now go in peace and love God and serve God's people. Amen.
It's like the replacing of the mask has become a part of our living. <laughs> Go in peace. <laughs>